on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Professor of Political Science at the University of Pennsylvania, Adolph Reed Jr., on his cover piece in Harper's Magazine, The Long, Slow Surrender of American Liberals. Uh, welcome to the program, Professor. Uh, thank you, and uh, thanks again for having me. Uh, now, all right, I, I, I really enjoyed your piece, and I've also been really sort of fascinated in some ways by uh, the, 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 the criticism of the piece, um, but uh, we, we will get to that in, in a bit. But let's, um, let's start with um, what, what has been the long, slow surrender of American liberals? Well, I guess in a nutshell, I would say that it's, um, we've been coerced, um, herded, um, and herded ourselves into accommodation with um, a, to uh, the agendas of a Democratic Party, ultimately that's been moving farther and farther to the right, made its concessions with the, uh, the neoliberalism at some point in the 80s, uh, consolidated it with in the Clinton presidency, and uh, that kind of set the terms of debate for us. Yeah, and you know, I, I mean, the one of the things that I think you know uh, that that really resonated uh, with me in your piece has been the um, the the perspective. I mean, uh, Bill Clinton remains incredibly popular in Democratic uh, circles, and right. uh, uh, I think even. It, it's fair to say, although I haven't seen any specific data on this, um, uh, in, in you know even in in self-identified liberals, um, and you know just for just give us, and, and, and in some of the criticism I've seen of your piece claims that that's not the case, and I I simply have found it to be the case, uh, frankly, that you know it's impossible to hear anybody mention welfare reform without it right. being lauded. Uh, and right. Um, right. it has been, particularly now, uh, really shown to be quite uh, disastrous. Um, but just go through, um, you know, what what do you think happened? I mean, what was it that that Clinton did that was uh, obviously, and and I think many of the people in the audience will is aware of it. But but how did that? Did it go through some type of revision, or it seems like contemporaneous? There was also sort of an acceptance at that time. Well, yes, there was. I mean, I think part of the problem is that, well, um, I think in a way it can start. I mean, the narrative could start earlier, of course, but, you know, it can always start earlier. Um, but uh, getting over the shock of Reaganism, uh, I think, knocked a lot of liberals for a loop and knocked, frankly, a lot of the left for a loop. I was just talking with a student last, last night about how some of us, uh, you know, a lot of us in the 70s, for instance, were... Uh, spent a lot of time trying to sharpen critiques of the of the social welfare state in in the U.S. from a left egalitarian perspective, and then all of a sudden we look up and Reagan is inaugurated and goes after every bit of social protection or begins to go after every bit of so social protection that we built up since the New Deal, and then people like me and a lot of others, Fran Piven, uh, you know, for instance, is a central person found ourselves in a position of having to defend, right, to hunker down and defend these institutions that we'd been trying to develop uh, a more progressive critique of. And it's not like there was disingenuousness. Uh, so in that sense, I think maybe, to be fair, a lot of people wound up some, somewhat like deer in the headlights. Uh, also, in the late 70s and the early 80s, um, you know, big employers went, I mean, start, um, you know, not least the federal government with uh, Reagan and the air traffic controllers, but went on the offensive against the labor movement. And, uh, and the trade union sector got put on the defensive, and this was a period of concessionary bargaining. Uh, you know, it kicked off, and we're still in it. Um, so the labor movement was back on its heels, and, and, and other sources of potential left criticism and political opposition were spimey, didn't know how to react, were in disarray, and uh, significant elites within the Democratic Party began to target new constituencies and you know, to compete with the Republicans for, for what was basically uh, a suburban, uh, socially liberal, economically um, neoliberal um, you know, constituency 
the Democratic Leadership Council, which was created after Mondale's defeat in 1984, of which both Clinton and Gore were presidents, uh, was, was, was formed expressly to push the National Democratic Party's agenda to the right, especially on economic issues, although many of them wanted to push it to the right on, on social issues. And then I think that after Carter's defeat, Mondale's defeat, and Dukakis's defeat, Clinton got to look like a stud to a lot of liberals just because he won. And it just goes, so the problem there is that if you define the standard of, of success downward so that um, any Democrat who, who can win office is, is our charger, well, you know, that's, that, that's another illustration of the problem. But with respect to the, the Clinton administration in, in particular, I'll just uh, pick up on your point and say, yes, I mean, he, you know, under Clinton, we saw, um, as, as you noted, with respect to so-called welfare reform, the elimination of the federal government's 60-year commitment to, uh, income, to provide income support for the indigent, and also um, the, the, um, um, the undercutting of the federal government's um, all, you know, commitment almost as long uh, to, to, provide, to direct provision of, of affordable housing for the poor. In, in, in the HOPE-6 program, which uh, really took off under the Clinton administration, NAFTA, which he pushed through over the opposition of many uh, congressional Democrats, um, it, it's, uh, and w w when we look at the student loan crisis now, um, you know, the Clinton administration was central in, in uh, the privatization of Sally May, the, the you know, student loan company, that 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 grossly or wildly expanded, um, you know, high interest unsubsidized, um, you know, student loans and fuel that. We can go on with the with uh, his support for uh, financial deregulation, um, and which helped to give us, you know, first the tech bubble and and burst, and then the housing bubble and burst. And he was by no means alone in those, but but he was no less culpable than than the Republicans were. And, then my God, on the foreign policy front, uh, I, I mentioned in the essay that Clinton conducted almost as many uh, military interventions overseas as Reagan and the first Bush combined, and in four fewer years. So, uh, as I and many others have said, it's kind of hard to imagine a Republican president who could have been more successful at pushing the Republican agenda uh, you know, during. Uh, the 90s. So then the question becomes, well, I, I mean, as you ask, uh, you know, why, why the nostalgia for him? And I think the answer is a combination of social amnesia, uh, you know, willful blindness, um, the reduction of the stakes of politics to just winning the office, right? And as the as the policy differences or the span of policy differences between Republicans and uh, Democrats narrows on so many issues, it becomes our guy versus, uh, you know, their guy. And I think, frankly, that many upper status, um, you know, de Democrat voters of the new liberal sort are basically um, well off um, you know, uh, the professional and managerial class folks who like to think of themselves as better and more compassionate and more intelligent than their Republican uh, neighbors, family members, and coworkers. Well, and in some respects, they, I think, they undoubtedly are. It's just that the right. we have lost this notion of any type of class consciousness within the context of our politics. And, right. and, and what's also, and I, just to add, I mean, I, I don't want to spend too much time on, on, on Clinton, but what's also fascinating to me is that this is a guy who enters into office with a democratically controlled uh, Senate and House and leaves right. without that. And right. somehow right. that right. Uh, that never gets I mean, even in the, in the context of that dynamic, you know, we uh, we love him because he won. Uh, but in fact, um, he, the there was a loss of uh, of the House and the Senate and. And so but let's turn. I mean, the reason why I wanted to start with Clinton is just because I think ultimately and and, and I don't want to mischaracterize your piece and, and tell me if I'm wrong. But there is it is incredibly important that we identify 
the difference between um, the Democratic Party and the left, if only mm-hmm. because that's the way um, th- that without that awareness, uh, it, it becomes it creates all sorts of problems in terms of getting to uh, left objectives. I, I, yes, yes, I think it's absolutely correct. And and so uh, let's all right. So let's let's go back to a little bit because one of the things that uh, and, and you touch on uh, at least uh, briefly in the piece is this sort of dynamic and, and more so in the context of, of President Obama, but the. Uh, the, I mean, it, as far as I understand it, there was sort of a, a cleave that took place between um, those involved in social emancipation movements and uh-huh. those involved in sort of economic justice movements or even labor uh, uh-huh. in the late 60s, early 70s. Um, and, and that became sort of the decoupling of or the mutual, ex- I don't want to say mutual exclusiveness, but the sort of the, the creating discrete silos within right. what we consider right. liberalism. Talk about that for a bit. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. In fact, that's that's the subject of the book that I'm trying to finish now, which actually began as an examination of the Obama mania uh, phenomenon. And the animating question is is still the same, which is why that so many people who should have known better, you know, not, you know, good-hearted people who don't pay attention to politics or, or kids who don't know anything, um, but people who were uh, politically sophisticated and, and have been around the lap a few, uh, and you track a few laps, um, you know, why did, why did so many of such people get swept up in the hype about Obama when it was pretty clear to anybody who looked closely that he was just another, you know, pretty ordinary neoliberal Democrat? Uh, and uh, the answer, uh, and and in trying to answer that question, uh, I found myself going back to uh, providing an account, actually, of the decline and transformation, because both things happened, of the left in the U.S. since the end of World War II. Yeah, uh, I mean, I I very much appreciate the your di- difficulty in characterizing. Uh, what kind of re- relationship uh, you know, developed between the two tendencies? Because it is very difficult to characterize. So I share it with you. Uh, and I mean, I think you're right. It's not that they broke broke entirely, but I think that what's happened, and I think this has happened consistently um, since the late '40s, it, it, is that um, pushes or at uh, at the moments when an egalitarian left had some, some social and uh, new political momentum. Uh, and that uh, momentum has been blocked or defeated. What's, what's happened is that the forces pushing for egalitarian agendas didn't go away, but had to make accommodations to the new sets of rules, to put it kind of crudely, that the, that the ruling capitalist class uh, you know, laid down. And one of the things that we find in the uh, shift in the late 60s is um, the beginnings of the shift that eventually becomes identity politics, where um, uh, there's a decoupling of, of um, the notion of racial inequality and injustice to some extent from a political economy. And then a little, and and at some point down the road, I think something kind of comparable happens with the women's movement. Uh, I think the environmental movement was a different kettle of fish all all altogether. There's never, I mean, there never was a sort of class conscious, um, and especially significant class conscious tendency in, or at least working class conscious tendency in in environmental movement, where there have been in the others, um, and as as um, the as the political and economic order uh, continued to evolve um, toward what we eventually came to recognize or call neoliberalism, all of the incentives ran for notions of so- social justice that were disconnected from 
from your political economy. And that's, for instance, my good friend Walter Michaels, who's an English professor and also uh, an activist in uh, the University of Illinois Chicago Faculty Union, which is in contract negotiations now for the first time with uh, the university, uh, but has argued that uh, the problem with notions with multiculturalism or diversity as as standards of justice and equality is that you can have a society in which 1% of the population controls 90% of the resources, but so long as that 1% is half female and 12% black and 12 or 13% uh, Latino and whatever the appropriate numbers would be gay, uh, then from the standpoint of of a multiculturalist or a diversitarian um, notion of of justice or equity, then you know you know then that would be a just just society. And I think we can see how that has played itself out, right? That's kind of what the Democrats have come to offer us. Um, you know, that's as as basically the left wing of ne- of uh, you know, neoliberalism. As I say in the essay, we find ourselves uh, with. Uh, in uh, in national politics with a choice between one neoliberal party that is open and progressive or that supports uh, multiculturalism and and, uh, diversity and another another neoliberal party that defines itself publicly by being opposed to multiculturalism and diversity. So I'm not saying that that's no, uh, no choice, but for uh, you know, because obviously, I think for most, uh, I think that uh, you know, most of us would would prefer the former to the latter. But mm. but for most of the things that eighty percent of the po- you know, for eighty percent of the of the matters that eighty percent of the population is concerned about eighty percent of the time, um, you know, the two parties agree, right? Uh, you know, uh, you know, job loss, uh, no fair labor standards, uh, um, uh, and 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 um, um, cutting the Public sector, you know, and I mean down the line. I mean, people forget, for instance, that it's, you know, that it's the Obama administration that is leading the charge on K through 12 public education all over the country now. Yes, in terms of uh, well, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, prioritization and stuff. Right? Is is this something that his? I mean, because it's almost as if it has has flipped in some way because i mean there was when when, when we're talking about the the new deal uh there was uh, concessions or and i don't maybe i'm uh not characterizing it correctly but the idea that uh african americans could participate in the new deal was very problematic at the time right i mean so those right. notions had to be cleaved from each other and it's almost as if uh, now the 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 social ap- emancipation movements, at least uh, within the context of the Democratic Party, are are used as a substitute. I mean, I you know, because I think about when Clinton came into office, um, you know, and I don't know that he made this choice, but certainly uh, it was a it was like the I guess the first hill that uh, part of the the Clinton administration uh, I don't want to say died on, but uh, was. The ideas of gays in the military, right. and right. I look to today to uh, our governor in, in, in New York State, uh, Andrew Cuomo, who has been uh, very good on marriage equality, um, uh, good on um, on uh, gun safety, uh, mm-hmm. but from an economic standpoint, um, has been you know I, I don't know that you could say he's been much better. Maybe he's been worse than Pataki, um, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it, th- this there's it's almost as if like this is a substitute uh, f- uh, for that as opposed to being commingled. Well, you know what? I mean, I think that's that's right. I mean, um, of course, you know the um, you know, evolution uh, of the separation, um, you know, has happened over decades, right? And it's and it's happened. Um, I think, in part, um, as rational r- responses on the part of activists um, to the matrix of incentives and uh, disincentives that are available to them. I mean, for instance, in in the late 1940s and the early 50s, there was con- considerable political and ideological pressure to um, 
separate, you know, from anti-communism, um, ultimately, to separate the civil rights agenda from from a political economic one, right? Uh, and to and one of the and uh, I mean, far be it for me ever to diminish the significance of racial of the Jim Crow order in the South and of the struggle against it. But one of the um, character or one one facet or byproduct of of the shift in black politics in the late 40s to to focusing on the challenge to Jim Crow um, was that it was um, consistent with didn't ruffle um, Cold War liberal concerns um, because the opposition to you know Jim Crow as a legal order was um, struck in the name of liberal you know, equality of, of of opportunity, right? Uh, and I mean, who could oppose that except the people who are benefiting from it in, immediately in the South? But the problem is, is that that you know that the reduction of of the notion of racial equality to equality of opportunity would mean ultimately that that blacks would be integrated into you know the class. Uh, into the American class hierarchy on on a relatively uh, equivalent basis, which means that most black people would still be getting the short end of the stick, just like most mo- most white people would. And I know this is an oversimplification, but I think that over time, um, and and uh, and and I'd like to say this. I hope it doesn't seem seem too cryptic, but I've come to think that just as important as the ways that progressive um, agendas have been defeated has been the terms on which they've been able to succeed within the framework of the larger defeat, right? That makes sense. Um, so that there's space that's available for you know, non-economic understandings of, of, of equality. And this it just has taken off more and more and more. Um, I mean, just, just to kind of stress, uh, I mean, the difference, um, I mean, this, this factoid just kind of boggles my, my mind, but a Roper poll taken the months before the 1944 presidential election found that 68 percent of respondents said that they um, wouldn't support a political and economic system, no matter what it was called, that didn't um, pivot on uh, on a guarantee that any person who was willing and able to work should have the right to a job. And you know, this was the year before. Um, Congressional um, you know, Democrats, with the support of you know, the CIO-based left, um, you know, actually pushed for um, a full employment bill in 1945 that 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 would have mandated that pursuit of full employment at a maximum of of three percent and a goal of two percent would be uh, you know, the cornerstone of American economic policy. Hmm. Uh, you know, the following year, um, what Walter Ruther in uh, contract negotiations with the United Auto Workers and GM called for the company to open the books. And jointly plan with the union profits and prices and uh, wages, right? With an eye on you know, containing inflation and keeping productivity up. So, I mean, that um, what I mentioned those factoids just as an illustration of how far the center of gravity of mainstream American politics has has shifted, right? Since you know, since 1945. I mean, it, it, you know, those um, um, you know, the sensibility. That's expressed in both those factoids. Uh, you know, no doubt seems like it's unthinkable to the vast majority of Americans alive today. So what? So I mean, what accounts for that? I mean, it, it's not. I, I mean, it, it, it's not that Democrats, um, you know, have sort of given up that ballast. I mean, this is more a. This is more a problem with the left or i mean you know is this more of a cultural uh, a problem and i mean what, what well, that's is a good it? question uh, um uh uh the russell jacoby who i also quote uh, quote in the article in this uh, you know really interesting book called the end of utopia i think that's the title uh it makes the point that li- liberals are really only as good as the left that's that's to their left uh and and that uh, you know liberals um uh, kind of, uh, kind of define themselves as you know not being left and not being, you know, I'm not being too far left and not being right. 
Uh, and as the institutional left has shriveled, um, uh, 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 atrophied, uh, been been uh, you know, beaten back increasingly since the 70s, uh, there just hasn't been um, a, an, an institutional base to sort of pull the Democratic liberals um, along in the direction of something that looks more like a social democratic agenda. And, I mean, it is important, too, that, you know, I mean, I think that Clintonism was, um, especially once once he gained the White House, um, you know, it was, in effect, a kind of putsch of, of the left wing of the Democratic Party. It was like the last gasp, right, of, of, of uh, what, what George uh, Stephanopoulos at one point called, you know, those those old time democrats uh, um and uh and uh, you're not in a flattering or uh, nostalgic way um so yeah i mean uh, um well um um i'm glad you mentioned the don't ask don't tell thing about the military too or, or whatever the thing was because i you know i was struck by that at the time i mean obviously you know i wouldn't oppose him 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 doing that but i think it's really significant in the context of um the congressional uh, majority that he squandered that you mentioned before, because it, frankly, it almost seemed like he wanted to run out the clock um, and lose control of Congress so that he wouldn't have to come through on the, on, on uh, the fight for labor law uh, I mean, reform that he promised the AFL-CIO. And I think there's something like that with Obama and, and the Employee Free Choice Act in 2008, too. Yeah, I mean, I I, I I wonder. I mean, I've I've heard different things. I mean, one my sense is, and I, I I'm, I'm not, you know, as clear uh, on on how the uh, the gays in the military uh, came about, and I don't know that it really was actually something that the, the the Clinton administration wanted to push early on. I think they were sort of boxed in on it, if I recall mm-hmm. correctly. And I have yeah, to say, I think that, that's probably right. And and and, and I think um, on EFCA, you know, there was uh, sort of a sense of. I'm not sure how how broad really the the passion was for it in, in terms of of Democrats uh, elected Democrats at the time, right. and it wasn't just something that uh, hey this is a way we can motivate what's left of uh, of the union movement. But oh, I think you're exactly right about that. I think that's exactly right. I don't think there's ever a snowball's chance in hell that Obama was going to support it, right? Yeah, or yeah. or uh, I mean, or to fight for it. But and see, this is the part of the problem, right? Because because the labor movement and other left of center constituencies that actually have some constituents, um, you get boxed in like every two years or four years with this because you've got to find a way to encourage people to vote for the Democrat. But if you make claims that are too large about how important it is to elect a Democrat, then, then if you elect him and he sells you out, you can't really go back to your constituents and say, well, you know, the the bastard just sold us out because that means that you look bad to them, right? Like either you're um, a liar to them or uh, stupid, right? So this is the central enough. dilemma, though, isn't it? I mean, there was right. one, yeah. there was one, um, you know, uh, Michelle Goldberg, I think, at the Nation, um, mm. uh, uh, charged you with electoral nihilism, and and I don't, I didn't read your piece as saying that. I mean, I think it was. Uh, I, you know, my sense is that you're not you're accepting the notion that there may uh, on Election Day, there may not be any other place to go. But right. the idea, the dilemma is, is exactly that uh, right. there well, is. No, no, exactly right. it, it's acknowledging there's no other place to go and that in some ways, the beginning of dealing with that problem is that very acknowledgement and sort of embracing the, that ambivalence on some level. Oh, no, I agree completely, yeah. I mean, I, uh, I couldn't have said it more succinctly my, myself. I mean, uh, and... Sorry, we, we, we lost you for a moment. So uh, we were talking about that, embracing that ambivalence. Right, uh, yeah, and I guess my point is that, that, that I agree with you, right, that the point is to acknowledge that this is the conundrum that, that we're in because that's the first step to trying to figure out ways to do to make it possible to do something else, right? To, uh, because the point is to try to have, have influence on the terms of political debate our, ourselves from, from, from the standpoint of, of, of a progressive left, left vision of how the society could be better than it is. 
Uh, yeah, I think, um, you know, Goldberg, I don't know. I mean, um, I think there's maybe a, a kind of a confusion such that the notion of, of um, you know, left uh, might be understood to be the same thing as Brooklyn uh, your dilettante. But, um, but, yeah, I mean, I think that was a misreading. Well, yeah, and, 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 and I mean, so this is all right. So let's start with that premise. I mean, this notion and, and then you 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 make it quite clear that, um, you know, that it's important to identify where President Obama is on this spectrum, if only to say that he's not of the left or, or liberal. And I think this is not, you know, maybe in. Uh, in circles online, there is an awareness of that. But I think broadly speaking, that's not shared by most of the people who vote for him. And there seems to be a, you know, I, I think uh, I, I read a transcript of an interview uh, that you did on Bill Moyers where you talk about the juxtaposition between President Obama talking about inequality in a speech, I think it was from December, and then uh, heading over to the Hill and demanding fast track. Um, right. Uh, yeah, it's mind-boggling, isn't it? And 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 I, th- you know, I think the thing is, is that there's just not either a, an awareness, broadly speaking. Obviously, people who follow this stuff are aware of it, but there is not right. an awareness of the vast majority of people who continue to, uh, you know, have full-throated support for the president. Right. Um, on the implications of these issues, and is that a function? And and I think largely that seems to me to be a function of the demise of the labor movement because that's the place where you go in you see your fellow workers and right. you're that's what they're talking about right uh, no that's right no yeah uh, but yeah it's absolutely correct i was going to say the same thing actually i think that's but i think that's a key problem and in the absence of 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 that kind of institution right um and and it's and it's breadth within the you know society uh, I mean, what we get is this really hollowed-out, candidate-centered uh, per, um, personality contest, and they're not even the real personalities, of course. They're the personalities that are crafted by the handlers. Um, so, and that's what, and that's how you wind up, you know, with this kind of frustratingly circular argument that, well, you got to elect them, uh, but you can't expect them to do anything. Um, and you can't criticize him. Well, you can't expect him to do anything because the other side is too powerful. But you can't criticize him uh, because he hasn't had a chance to do anything because the other side is so powerful. Uh, so you can't expect him to do anything. You can't criticize him for not doing anything. And you have to support him because the other side is attacking him. And the other guy's worse, but you have to elect him. Or, or the other guy's worse, so you have to elect him. And it's just a merry-go-round. It's just... Um, astounding, but if you take a couple steps back from it. But, you know, I think one of the problems, to be honest, is um, is um, you know, in a perverse way, I think MSNBC is kind of a tool of the right in the sense that uh, you know, not just because it does the same kind of work for uh, you know, Democrats that Fox, Fox does for you know, for the Republicans, but um, but just this an approach to politics and to political events that just uh, you reduced to this sort of breathless babble of ultimately meaningless factoids right and the and the notion that uh you know being progressive is like being au courant with like every little twist and turn in the horse race aspects of politics and and the kabuki theater like around the budget you know this uh, of show, showdowns and that kind of stuff uh, and that's what most people have. That's what most people who, 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 who consider themselves Democrats or you left of center, have access to that in the nation. Uh, you know, as a way of, uh, of uh, trying to um, get their, or that, that, that pretends to take the place of the labor press and the trade union culture that you mentioned earlier. And that's a tremendous loss, right? And, and, and I mean demobilization. Uh, in uh, um, in uh, you know, minority communities and all that kind of stuff has happened too, which uh, which carries the same tendon or has the same effect as as a, as a, you know, the atrophy of of uh, the trade union culture. And, and so, what is I mean? So with that, w- w- once you start with the the idea that uh, you know uh, step one is at least identifying 
the shortcomings mm -hmm. of of those politicians who are really in 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 at this moment may be the only uh, uh, option. You know, the mm -hmm. lesser of two evils. Um, uh, the, what happens? What happens then? Well, then I think what has to happen, and I think you know, I mean, I'm I'm not the sort. I don't have enough of an imagination to you know lay out um, you know you know a grand vision of uh, you know what we should do. But I think what has to happen is that people who are committed and are politically serious, uh, and that means you know especially. In and and in relation to the labor movement, because I think that's got to be the anchor of any sort of um, um, rebuilt or a renewed left. Just as a renewed left is, uh, it has to be um, part of the grounding of of a revitalized trade union movement. Um, to you know, to begin to talk strategically about things we can do. I mean, I've you know, I was involved for a number of years with an effort to. To um, you know, to uh, build an independent um, I mean, labor party, um, which you know didn't succeed ultimately, and there were good reasons, and there are reasons that it didn't, and it's worth considering those too. But but I mention that because um, one thing I think that we w were correct about was that the key to building the broad kind of class w working class based broad social and political movement that we need doesn't run through the electoral arena, it runs through social movement organizing around, um, you know, most likely around issue-based camp campaigns that cut cut very widely. I mean, one of them that we thought, you know, that uh, that 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 may have less potential now uh, than than it did before Obamacare, but may have more potential again soon because of the limitations, uh, the limitations of Obamacare is a single-payer health care movement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about others uh, push for a revitalized public sector and, you know, I mean, decommodification of, of, of public services, although, you know, that's not a good slogan, but you get the idea. Right. Uh, and, you know, things like that, right? I mean, um, the, you know, the, what, I mean, the impulse ha has to be to try to build politically around pursuit of issues that connect with the as broadly as possible within the broad class of us who are expected to work for a living every day, right? To get them to go to work every day, um, and 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 I and I think among the reasons that the labor movement has to be central to that kind of undertaking are one, the foundations aren't going to fund that kind of movement, so and you need to have resources, two. Um, as as much as many um, you know left types um, um, uh, sneer at how weak and small the trade union movement is, I always say, well, compared to what? So what else you got, right? Right. Uh, uh, there are millions of working people in unions who are who don't just live at the workplace, right? As you indicated, they have family, friends. They they're in bowling leagues and lit little leagues and and uh, wine sipping clubs or whatever right um, and that's a base of organizing and and talent like as as you know, well as as what well as a base of resources and it's also um, you know the the identity um, as um, a worker um, or a person if you if one would prefer who's expected to work for a living um, that that cuts most broadly uh, in uh, you know through uh, you know through the majority of of uh, of uh, of the American population, and that's actually the basis for building solidarity. So, you know, I think that's that's the that's the direction that we need to try to go into, and the understanding that you know that's a long term um, you know, undertaking. But as I often say, we didn't get into this position overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight. And and while understanding at the same time that the electoral realm is going to be what the electoral realm is until we can build something strong enough to change it and what that means is that between now and then uh what what electoral politics is going to be all about is um the lesser of two evils and the vast majority of time you know that that lesser is likely to be a democrat um and, you know i lived in uh i lived in uh in connecticut in the 80s so i understand very well that every now and again the lesser evil is going to be a republican um <laughs> right. <laughs> right and as i said i'm 
Uh, I am still proud not ever to have voted for Joe Lieberman for anything. Uh, well, I, I I was in college in uh, in Connecticut uh, in uh, in the eighties and and developed my distaste for Joe Lieberman, just watching him doing com- late night commercials and somehow taking credit as the Attorney General for for the tolls being removed from uh, the toll roads. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. I, I forgot I, all about that. That's right. Yes. <laughs> But yeah. well, let me ask you this: How do you respond to some of the criticism I've seen of the piece that you're that you that you don't acknowledge that some of what you're talking about is happening now? I mean, uh, I guess today there was a story about a um, about the uh, corporate uh, the quarterly report I think from uh, McDonald's or uh, oh yeah, I saw that. Su- suggesting right. that uh, they may have to raise uh, wages basically because of. It hasn't. It, I mean, it's been a labor, uh, you know, broadly speaking, a labor movement. Uh, mm-hmm. The strikes and and the adoption, at the least, of uh, in the uh, of Democrats, uh, broadly speaking, of the minimum wage. We've got a, a candidate in Kentucky running on uh, raising the minimum wage. I mean, is right. some of that happening now? Yes. Uh, yeah. In fact, I was just emailing with a friend of uh, you know, mine about that question a little while ago. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, some things are happening, right? I mean, uh, you know, I never uh, intended to argue that uh, you know uh, there's no- nothing going on, but what I would say though is that um, you know there's a tendency for that kind of activity to well, I have two things to say. One is that there's a tendency for that kind of activity to be- become trapped in the issue silos that you mentioned, right? Um, and 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 what we need is like a larger vision for transformation and a program, right? Uh, and one might say, well, it's possible that 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 these efforts will g- generate that that a vision. Uh, you know, I think that's a different um, that uh, I think that's a perspective also that um, that I that I that I tend to identify with Alinskyism, and I think it's kind of a romantic one or or it's both uh, romantic and technicistic at the same time, in the sense that 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 the technique doesn't produce the program, right? So, so yeah, I mean, I think that what we need is a way to harness, um, you know, these uh, I mean, these initiatives uh, you know, to mention, and uh, you know, others like them, like the worker center stuff, you know, and others, uh, but to harness them to. Um, a broader working class, uh, I mean, political agenda. I mean, um, I mean, in, in that regard, I mean, how do you how do you see Elizabeth Warren? I mean, because I, I, on on one level, there's at least been uh, she has been used by the left as a way of saying, you know, uh, there's I think you know I, I'm of the Elizabeth Warren wing of the Democratic Party. Right, I mean, right. to sort of make that differentiation. Um, but give me, tell me your perspective on, on, on what she represents and, and, and how that fits into what you perceive needs to happen. Right. Well, sure. I mean, I don't have any beef with, with Warren. I think, you know, she's, you know, I, what well, I think she's a good person. It sounds like she's, she's, she's playing a good role in the Senate. I frankly don't know enough about her, um, her economic orientation, right, um, to, um, to get too excited or frightened, or, or to get frightened by it, I've not seen it. But, but I haven't seen anything that leads me to think that she has or would have um, a, um, a kind of um, a desirably so- social democratic um, you know, economic perspective, right? Um, so I don't know. Uh, but I will say this. So, um, ir- irrespective of whatever Warren's merits are on her own, I think that tendency to look for um, you know the lightning rod mm. uh, is a huge problem. I mean, and I'll give you a comparable illustration: uh, the Wendy Davis in, in the, the Texas, right? So she's uh, you know, all of a sudden a star and carrying the hopes and dreams of of liberal or left liberal Dems, and it turns out she's basically a Republican, and 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 as soon as she declared for governor, she began to backtrack from the stuff that 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 had made her nationally prominent in the first place. 
and that just happens over and over and over. I mean, it happened with Obama, and, and you know, um, and and I mean with others. And it's uh, you know, that's a curious thing about it, right? That there just doesn't seem to be a learning curve, right? Because each instance is um, is a, you know de novo, right? So, each uh, new. So we don't want to necessarily be a part of the Elizabeth Warren wing of the Democratic Party. We want to be part of the um, egalitarian left or the right, exactly. uh, uh, wing of the Democratic Party. Yeah, I feel a lot more comfortable with that. Yeah, well, I mean, that's, um, I, I mean, I think that's a good point. I mean, that is the one thing that I, I have to say, and I, you know, I, I, I have, I think, uh, more confidence in um, her, uh, her economic uh, policies, at least based on, on what I've seen, whether it's from the... Uh, setting up the Consumer Finance Protection Bureau and mm-hmm. her pursuit of, of banks, uh, I am I am I'm less comfortable with that being the brand. Um, right, frankly. right, right. I got you. Yep. Um, but yep, I'm with you on that too. And like I said, I'm, you know, my um, uh, I'm not enthusiastic, uh, um, uh, mainly because I'm agnostic. I just don't know enough about her, really. Well, um, the the piece is is fascinating. I know it's it's behind a uh, it's in the uh, the print edition of Harper's, uh, so folks are going to have to um, buy some paper, I guess, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, to read it. Um, but I well, really the workers have to get paid, you know. I, I, indeed, indeed. Um, uh, Adolph Reed Jr., uh, I appreciate uh, your time today. The piece is The Long, Slow Surrender of American Liberals. Thanks so much for, for coming on and talking oh, about it. Oh, thanks very much for having me. It was a pleasure. It's, it, it's a true delight. You're my favorite. Oh, well, thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do it again soon uh, once oh, that yeah, book comes so. up. Yeah. All right. Great. Bye-bye. Thanks.